Hello and welcome to Africa Update on Trust TV and we'll give you updates and news of what's happening on our great continent, Africa. This week on the show, we're going to be taking a look at a few things happening in Congo, South Africa and other parts of the continent. Please do stay with us. We'll be right back. It's the Africa Update here on Trust TV and I'm your host, Chiamaka. Wonderful. Now, government forces in the Democratic Republic of Congo on Saturday successfully thwarted an attempted coup. The incident, which unfolded at night, left the nation on edge as authorities worked to restore order and investigate those involved. Now, meanwhile, Vital Kamehe, an ally of President Felix Tshisekedi, returned to a role he had led before. Now, Kamara was a speaker of the National Assembly from 2006 to 2009 and was elected again on Wednesday to the same position, ending months of bickering and a threat by the president to dissolve parliament. His election as speaker of parliament paves way for the formation of a new government. Now, here's more the report from Africa News. Self-exiled opposition leader Kristen Malanga posted a video on his Facebook page early on Sunday threatening Congolese President Felix Tshisekedi in what the Congolese army later said was a foiled coup. In the footage filmed inside the presidential palace, Malanga stands surrounded by men in military uniforms. The men were initially identified as Congolese soldiers in local media but were later linked to Malanga. Security forces killed the leader of the coup and around 50 people, including three American citizens, were arrested, according to one army spokesperson. Gunfire erupted at approximately 4 a.m. and armed men attacked the presidential office in the city center. Malanga was seen walking outside the palace, filming men in military uniform as they burned the Congolese flags. The ally of President Felix Tshisekedi returns to a role he's held before. Vital Kamere, Speaker of the National Assembly from 2006 to 2009, was elected Wednesday to the same role, ending months of bickering and a threat by the President to dissolve Parliament. A veteran of Congolese politics, the 65-year-old became allies with Tshisekedi in 2018 when he withdrew his candidacy for President. His union for the Congolese Nation Party also played a key role in helping Tshisekedi dismantle a coalition with his predecessor Joseph Kabila in 2020. But Kamere, who served as Tshisekedi's chief of staff, was soon arrested and sentenced to 20 years in prison for embezzlement. In 2023, Kamere returned to the cabinet as economy minister just in time for the election in which Tshisekedi won a second term as president. Now, joining me via a phone call to further discuss this and other issues we'll be looking at on the program today is Ambassador Suleiman Dahiru, a former Nigerian diplomat. Good evening, Ambassador. Thank you for joining us on Africa Update today. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm sure you've um, heard the, the, the package that was played. Now, um, this coup, generally, what, what do you make of the coup, of the attempted coup, actually, rather, the attempted coup that, was, that almost took place in DRC? Now, you have to look at the history of DRC. DRC has not been a steady and stable country since its independence from Belgium, Congo or from Belgium. Now, after independence, we had the Lumumba episode. A moist zombie. Then Mobutu. After that, we got Desire a, a what is his second name? Uh, Kabila. He was assassinated as his son, Joseph Kabila, took over. He ruled for many years before he lost an election to the present president. 
Now, since this president came into office, he has not had any peaceful stay in office. There's the rebels, there are the rebels fighting his government. Then you have Paul Kagame in Kabila alleging to be sponsoring the militia to destabilize that government. Therefore, when the attempted coup took place, it shouldn't have surprised anybody at all because the country itself has not been stable. Okay. But to me, it was good that the attempted coup was foiled. But another dimension to the attempted coup is the issue of the three so-called CIA agents, CIA agents okay. th that were arrested. Okay. Now, if you remember, the CIA has over the years been involved in destabilization in, in various parts of the world. You remember what happened in Chile when the government of Salvador Allende was toppled, he was assassinated. So the CIA has a history of destabilization in okay. the countries that the United States is not happy with. Okay. So that is the short story I will give you. Okay. Now, you just mentioned that you were glad that the coup was foiled. What do you actually make of that swift intervention, you know, where it didn't even last up to hours and the whole thing was just shut down? No, it, it, it must have uh, foiled simply because the soldiers that were in charge of the presidential palace or the presidential office were loyal to the president. So they refused to join in the attempted coup, and they succeeded in foiling it. So to me, it is a good omen. If we will have standing forces all over Africa that will foil any attempt to stage a military coup, like what we have seen in Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Gabon. Coup d'etat in whatever guise is an issue that should have been buried a long time ago. But unfortunately, there are some soldiers that are desperate for power and therefore they want to stage a coup d'etat. But at the same time, I have always said it and I will keep on saying it the antidote to who data is good governance. Any government that is ruling properly and the people are satisfied with that government, who data is not going to succeed. Even if it succeeds in toppling the government, the populace will come out to demonstrate against the coup. Like we had in Nigeria, when General Mutala Mohammed was assassinated during an attempted coup, I was in Lagos as a young officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. People came out on the, onto the streets to demonstrate against the attempted coup because they felt that there was absolutely no justification for the uncertain coup. So what I'm saying is that rulers, wherever they are in Africa, they must rule with justice and fairness and also the fear of God. That is what will obviate any attempted coup d'etat. Okay. And of course, to, to, to help buttress your point, we saw what happened in Niger, that when the coup happened, it was the people that came out to actually rejoice about the coup. So, yes, good governance will play a very important role in stopping coup d'etat from taking place in the African continent. Now, let's, let's go to the 
a next question. There's, there's speculations now that this uh, attempted coup may have been some sort of dry run or a dress rehearsal, like for a bigger thing happening. Do you actually share those sentiments? Pardon? There are certain speculations that the coup could have been a, like a rehearsal or a dry run for something bigger to happen. Now, do you share those sentiments? No, I don't want to share in any specific speculation. I always want to comment on something tangible. But if it is speculation, always people will speculate. But speculation is something that may happen or may not happen. Since it is something that may happen or may not happen, it is not right of me to start commenting on it. So let's just be happy that the coup attempt was foiled. Okay. So now let's go back to the Americans who were over there, who were arrested. Now we've seen videos where the family say that there are Americans that came on holiday. But uh, away from that, as you said before, the CIA have always had a way in going to destabilize and topple governments. Now, what does this actually pretend, you know, for diplomatic relations and international politics. Now, taking into cognizance the fact that even the likes of Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger are wanting to leave ECOWAS because they think that ECOWAS is an extension of Western influence. How does this all play? In? Now, let's face it. Every country in the world has an interest to pursue in its international relations with other countries. When you establish diplomatic relations with, say, country A, the country establishing the diplomatic relations is in pursuit of something, or it wants to be in the global community. But as I said, when you establish diplomatic relations, there are interests you pursue. That is why it is said in international relations, there are no permanent friends or permanent enemies. enemies. Yeah. You just pursue your national interests. Interest. Now, when you get bigger countries or those countries that, who think that they have the money, the resources, and everything to do whatever they want, or then other countries to follow their own dictates, then you start having problems. And we have had this problem with the CIA destabilizing many countries. We have had examples that I, I gave in Chile when Salvador Allende was toppled and, uh, and killed. We, we had the case of Mali, where the CIA agents were caught, killed, and their dead bodies were dragged all over the streets of Mogadishu. There are other places where people are expressing dissatisfaction with the way and manner the American uh, CIA is dictating what should be done. And whatever CIA is doing, it is doing it on behalf of the United States government. It is not, it, is, it has a mandate, and it is carrying out the mandate assigned to it. Okay. So, uh, countries must be very, very careful in terms of how they relate with other countries. I, what I'm saying, no country should be in isolation. But at the same time, you have your own national interest to guard. Don't allow any country to dictate to you how you conduct your affairs. That means you are surrendering your sovereignty to that particular country. And okay. this is what the Americans like. The Americans want to dictate how things should be done. But that is not the way it should happen in international relations okay. and in diplomatic relations.
Okay, okay, Ambassador. So let's, we're going to move away from Congo now to another thing happening in South Africa. Now, South Africa's highest court has barred former President Jacob Zuma from running for parliament in next week's general election. The Constitutional Court ruled that his 15-month prison sentence for contempt of court disqualified him. Zuma was convicted in 2021 for refusing to testify at an inquiry investigation corruption during his presidency, which ended in 2018. Now, he has been campaigning under the banner of the newly formed Mukonto Wesizwe MK party after falling out with the governing African National Congress. Ambassador, I'm sure you're aware of what's happening in South Africa. Yes, uh, uh, let me tell you, I am profoundly disappointed by the action of Jacob Zuma. Whatever he became in his life, ANC made it possible for him to rise to become, to, to rise to the highest office in the land. While in the office as president, there were so many scandals around him. There are so many corruption cases around him. In front, there are cases of immorality against him. To me, such a person, having been disgraced out of office, should not, I repeat, should not make any effort to come to look for public office again. Therefore, what the highest court in the land decided that he would not be on the ballot. I am perfectly comfortable with it. Now, the issue of Jacob Zuma is the problem we have on the continent of Africa. We have leaders who don't know when enough is enough. Mm. The moment you don't know when enough is enough, then problems start all over the place. Now, you look at the continent of Africa, you have so many sick, tight leaders. Yeah. As if they were brought by Almighty God to be there for forever. Mm. So it's like but we're running a not, mo mo monarchy kind of government in, in, in yeah, Africa. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, if you look at uh, uh, Port Vila, uh, in there, uh, I was in Sudan as ambassador. Omar uh, Al Bashir was later toppled after standing almost 30 years on the throne. Uh, Yoweri Museveni in uh, Kampala is there, he's grooming his son. In, in, in Togo, Yashimbe Ayajima was there for all, over 30 years. Yeah. When he left, his son took over, and the son has spent 20 years in office, and he is still wanting to remain in office. The one in Gabon has uh, been toppled uh, quite often. Uh, 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 in Libya, uh, Gaddafi was, was there for ages, almost 40 years. Hmm. Now, when you are in office for all these years, what, what are you thinking in your head? Hmm. You think that you are the only person in the country that can rule it? Or you think that other people are not worth cons considering? This is a disease that is affecting Africa. Okay. Uh, Mohammed Edris Debi Itno was just born in yesterday. Yes. Now, his father died. He was brought in as interim president. Mm -hmm. His first three years as interim president. When the terms of his being an interim president was changed from being ineligible to run for election to now run for election. election yeah. And he ran, taking over from where his father stopped. 
Yoweri Museveni is grooming his own son mm. to take over okay. for him. All right. So, all right, Ambassador, I know you have so much to say about this. I can see how passionate you are about it. But we have some other things to cover. And uh, just yesterday, um, the Secretary General of the UN has said something quite profound. He's talking about the Africa role in global peace and security. And he said and told the Security Council on Thursday that peace was the key to unlocking Africa's future and to strengthening the continent's voice and influence in building peace globally. Now, let's take a look at this report from Africa News. Now's the time to unleash Africa's peace power. That was the message United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres told the Security Council on Thursday. He said peace was key to unlocking Africa's future and to strengthening its influence in building peace globally. Africa is an important voice for the global good. The continent is home to many examples of unity and solidarity in a fractured world. We see this unity in Africa's focus on ending poverty and hunger, supporting refugees fleeing across borders and achieving sustainable development. And we see it in the continent's efforts to work together to build a modern, diverse, innovative and powerful continental economy to benefit all Africans. He outlined three steps to strengthen its peace leadership, including first finding peace in Africa itself. Africa deserves a voice in the global peace and security architecture. But Africa's voice can only be heard if African countries can participate in global governance structures as equals. This must include correcting the lack of permanent African representation at this council. It must also include reforming the global financial architecture, especially its handling of debt, so that African countries have the support they need to climb the development ladder. He said the UN September Summit of the Future will be an opportunity to push forward on these issues. Ambassador, I'm sure you've heard what uh, the UN SecGen has said about Africa. What's your take on it? Now, the UN Secretary General, he has been very forceful in speaking out his mind on global issues. Mm. He has not spared Israel over his genocide in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Now, when you look at it, as blessed as Africa is, why should we be in the position we are in? We are in the position we are in simply because of failure of leadership. If you have good leadership, things will move well. Paul Kagame, although I have lost respect for him because of his inordinate ambition to continue to rule, mm. one cannot deny the fact that Paul Kagame has won. And that is why Rwanda has become the darling of the Western world. There is stability and there is good governance. Now, if Rwanda can do it, why can't other African countries do yeah. it? Yeah. It is just a question of leadership. Yeah. We are lacking transformative and visionary leadership on the continent of Africa. As rich as the continent of Africa is, the richest continent in the world, mm -hmm. all the resources will remain buried underground when our leaders don't know what to do. Mm. Or they allow the Western world to come and exploit these resources almost for free. Mm. France was doing that in Niger with the uranium. Now, the military rulers in Niger have kicked out 
mm-hmm. the French. Mm. So we'll see how they are going to manage the uranium resources they have. Whether after kicking out the French, they are they will going to do a better allow, job of managing. They will now allow a Russia to become the new colonial masters. Mm. So there is the need for the African leader maybe to convene a meeting and invite African intellectuals who are not afraid to see it, to say it the way it is, and tell them to their faces that you people are dis- disappointing the continent of Africa oh, and that you must speak up. Okay. Otherwise, Africa will remain the laughing stock okay. of the world. All right. Yes. Thank you so much, Ambassador Suleiman Dari, who has been a wonderful pleasure having you on the program today with your insights. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, it's still Africa Update here on Trust TV. More when we return from this break. Please just stay with us. Welcome back. It's still Africa based on Trust TV. Now, General Mohammed Idris Derby Itno, who has led Chad's military junta for three years, was sworn in as president on Thursday after an election victory contested by the opposition. Derby officially won 61% of the May 6th vote that international NGOs said was neither credible nor free, and which his main rival called a masquerade. Now, while taking the oath of office, Debbie said he swore before the Chadian people to fulfill the high functions that the nation has entrusted in him. Take a look. Chad's president-elect Mohammed Idris Dibi Itno was sworn in on Thursday at a ceremony attended by several leaders from the region. His inauguration came a week after the Constitutional Council confirmed he'd won the disputed May the 6th election outright with 61% of the vote. He seized power three years ago after the death of his father, Idris Debi, who'd ruled Chad with an iron fist for three decades. Mohammed Idris Debi Itno, President of the Republic, élu selon les lois du pays. Opposition leader Sukse Masra, a staunch opponent of the junta, won an 18.5% share of the vote. He contested the results of the election which international NGOs described as neither credible nor free. Masra resigned as Prime Minister on Wednesday and did not attend the ceremony. It's been a very, very insightful, informative and educative time on Africa Update this week, discussing things happening on the continent, most especially in Congo, South Africa, and of course what the section of UN said about the African continent. So I see you same time, same place next week. Please don't stay with us and do well to follow us on all our social media platforms and on our YouTube live stream. I am Chamaka Marfo. Bye for now.